first of all, I'm a communication psychologist and a color psychologist. Before I was a, a doctor, I was much more into psychology. I still do therapy with some of my cancer patients. I've written a book, how many years ago? 27 years ago, called Heart Health. I have a few books on the heart, one with magnesium as the ultimate heart medicine. But in this book called Heart Health, it's about the emotional center, the capacity to feel. And in this book, my contribution to psychology or spirituality is I define the heart, give it a, a really solid definition, because in the Bible, they don't really define it. They talk about it as the vulnerability of being. The heart feels, and we feel our emotions, emotions and feelings being different. Episode 22 with Dr. Mark Circus. Dr. Mark Circus has been practicing alternative medicine for decades and has wrote tens of books on various different alternative natural and organic ways of healing the body. Uh, in this episode, we talk about taking back your medical freedom and he offers many different solutions and examples of um, successful recoveries that he's had with his patients over the years. We also discuss his full protocol. Um, as always, please like, share and subscribe. We wanna get the word out there um, people like Dr. Circus has been doing some great work over the last few decades and um, we want to make sure that people are able to find his work and to hopefully practice and use some of the, the information that's in this interview. So I hope you enjoy and I will see you on the other side. <clears throat> Maybe the best place to start out is where I'm at right now which is the whole thing, the whole picture, the whole protocol. And it's like basically I've created a new where well, you should start. To, we should start. Yeah, yeah, start? Okay. yeah, yeah. Now, I'm a very interesting place in my life, in my work, professional work, because I've kind of finished 20 years of work. And what I've developed is a new system of medicine. Simple, deep, efficient, brilliant, but finished. And so my job is to try to take things to a new level and bring this system of medicine to the world, which is not easy, especially with all the censorship I've been censored by Google for, I guess, four years, four or five years now. Since they started censoring, they hit me first. And um, so it's, I've been swimming upriver, you know, all these years, able to maintain everything and grow things. But still, um, the mainstream totally ignores me. I'm totally against the mainstream. Uh, I'm the I'm the uh, doctor in the world who who coined the term. This is 18, 19 years ago. Pharmaceutical terrorism. To me, the whole medical industrial complex is uh, they're the worst terrorists in the world. The the Muslims can't even, you know, they don't can't compete at all. Since COVID came, things have gotten only worse, totally destroyed the reputation and integrity of modern medicine. The best estimates I have is 17 million people killed. So I'm totally against it. In my system of medicine, when I say it's simple, for instance, and logical, which med modern medicine is not at all. If we take an example of a person coming out of a desert, not having any water for four days, what's the medicine for that person? It's water. 
a mainstream doctor would probably give a statin drug or something. You know, they they don't have any sense of what the body needs to heal. We talk about magnesium. Basically, officially in the world, using the wrong tests for magnesium, mainstream medicine will say between 50 and 67% of people are magnesium deficient. If you look at people with chronic disease, you're talking about 99.999% are going to be magnesium deficient. Same level of coming out of a desert with no water. What do you have to give first? As a first, not as a supplement, as medicine. Magnesium. You know, there's a product you're probably familiar with, magnesium oil. There's no oil in it, but it's 35% magnesium. It's very oily. And it's a great uh, analogy because magnesium is the oil to the body. It's... I can't think of anything in the body that's not involved with. And yet, will doctors prescribe it? No. No. It's, it's hard to actually find clear and obvious medically, um, like, you know, suggested um, symptoms of low magnesium. It's only when you look at, like, your work and others where you can actually start to build a picture as to how a lot of uh, different symptoms are actually related to magnesium. Well, it's not just symptoms. You know, in America, 100 million people either have diabetes or metabolic syndrome. You know, there is something exists called medical science, and modern medicine doesn't pay any attention to it. It's not a mystery that magnesium is involved with insulin production, the shape of the enzyme, so its efficiency, and insulin receptivity of the cells, all magnesium mediated. Every single person, every single one of them who's either metabolic syndrome or diabetes is deficient in magnesium. It's science, it's science. And even though, even when they do publish something about magnesium, they'll acknowledge how many people, they don't say healthy or chronically ill populations, they don't differentiate. They don't know how to think, they don't know how to think. But the first thing, just like this logic of giving water to a dehydrated person, you give magnesium, to every single chronically ill person, and even acute diseases, if you get the flu. We've, you know, medical, you know, brilliant medical doctors for a century, if you flood the body every few hours with magnesium, it's the best. It's, it works for acute infections. Yeah. Of course, in my system of medicine, it's not the only thing, but then we get to bicarbonate. I'm the world's expert on bicarbonate and CO2 medicine. You know, we live in a CO2 demented world. You know, they made an enemy out of CO2 when without CO2, there's no life on the planet. Without CO2, there's no oxygen. Plants couldn't make oxygen. Almost every person alive today is breathing too fast. When I was born 71 years ago, the medical norm for breathing was eight breaths a minute. Perfect breathing is six. I had a cancer patient yesterday. He's breathing at 24. What's the problem with breathing too fast? You know, a regular doctor, if he even has any idea about breathing, usually it's only emergency doctors and ICU doctors and the ambulance people pay attention to breathing because the person's near, 
Between life and death, you better pay attention to the breathing. Regular doctors having a clue. Problem with breathing too fast is you're breathing out too much CO2. Lowering the CO2 in the blood. And since 1940, medical science knows you, oxygen and CO2 are perfect yin yang. CO2 goes down in the blood, oxygen delivery to the cells goes down with it. Yeah. The miracle of bicarbonate is you put a lemon in the glass, so you drink it straight with water and it hits the stomach acid, or well, lemon is an acid. Acid turns bicarbonate into CO2, and it goes into the bloodstream back in the form of bicarbonate, you know, right through the stomach wall. And in the blood, CO2 and bicarbonate are twin sisters. They're two forms of the same thing, and they turn into each other at the speed of light, almost the speed of light. And this is, you know, be between breathing too fast, tox you know, the water, the air, and food are full of toxins. We chemically polluted this planet, forever chemicals, lead, mercury. Mercury is the worst thing in the world right now. They yeah. put out like 20 tons of, into the atmosphere every day with the coal-fired plants. We have nutritional deficiencies. All of these things make us more acidic, make us deficient in bicarbonate, deficient in CO2. So what's the second medicine? It's, it's a toss up, which is first and second, bicarbonate or magnesium. And in fact, we have a the best water in the world is high in magnesium bicarbonate. How, how, um, how do you take your, your um, bicarbonate soda? Are we talking pinch of baking soda. I, I know in other interviews you spoke about making sure it's pure, there's no aluminium in there. Obviously you want to get the purest stuff you can. Are you talking quarter of a teaspoon a day or how, how what would you recommend for an average well, health person? Well, it depends if you're a cancer patient or you're diabetic or you're a totally healthy person. And how many totally healthy people are on the planet these days? I'm not sure. Yeah. Not easy to be totally healthy in this world of ours especially with people going crazy because governments have lost their the they've lost they have their screw, screws missing from their brains you know emotional stuff and spiritual stuff and mental stuff all weighs heavily on the body yeah when i when i recently i haven't been using bicarbonate so I do to to keep to to increase my CO2. I use this device. Comes from Russia, called the Frolov breathing device. All my cancer patients use it. There's a little bit of water in. You breathe in through your nose and you breathe out through the machine. You blow bubbles. You breathe through the water and the water puts a break on your breathing. I use this every day, and um, when I breathe with this, I'm breathing three or four breaths a minute. Wow. That raises my CO2 in my blood. This morning, this morning, first, I've been very lazy lately. First time in a month, I used my CO2 dry suit. It's this thing that, you know, you get into it, it comes up to your neck and seals around your neck, big blue thing. You pull out the oxygen with a vacuum cleaner, and then you take a CO2 tank, food grade, and you fill up this, this suit until you look like the Michelin man. You're a big thing puffed out. You lay it down and you, taking a bath in CO2. Coming on the market just this last month are CO2 inhalers, where you, you use the same type of tank, but instead of getting in a suit, 
which can get, you know, pain in the ass after a while. You can just put this thing on your nose and breathe for four minutes and get a hit of CO2, raising your CO2. So the key, so there's lots of, uh, whether it's the breathing, whether it's the baking soda, it's essentially getting that CO2 to balance the oxygen, to carry the oxygen to the cells. That's, exactly. the, that's the end goal. Do you, do you do much in terms of like, I mean, an obvious one would be like nasal breathing, diaphragmatic breathing, or maybe people take their mouth when they go to sleep. Do you recommend things like that as just like a simple lifestyle? Well, if you're not breathing through your belly, you're not breathing correctly. That one of the reasons why we be breathing faster than 70 years ago is because people are frozen emotionally mm -hmm. and their diaphragm is locked up. So they don't breathe through their belly like a baby. They're breathing quicker from their, up here in the chest. That's not how you breathe. That's how you breathe fast. Yeah. That's how you make sure the oxygen doesn't get down into the kidneys, into the you know, you took a look at Chinese medicine and getting the chi from the air, the pr prana, down. You breathe into the belly. So, yes, I do yoga every day. I don't know how I would exist without it. And breathing. Well, if you don't work at your breathing, you're going to be a lousy breather. Yeah. You, you mentioned about... I mean, I, we'll get back on track anyway, but you pointed things out and I'm thinking, oh, I need to ask about that. But I don't want to take you too far away from your protocol. Um, maybe we can come back to this, actually, but emotional factors. So I've had a few guests on now where we've really gone into the emotional side of things. Um, and it really does seem to be one of the key factors, including if you live around toxins, you mentioned mercury. Uh, could be mold, moldy house, you know, it could be any type of uh, toxin in your environment. I feel like it just makes things 10 times worse when you have, say, buried down trauma, psychological issues, stress. Uh, and it doesn't always have to be like I'm stressed at the moment. I get married in four weeks. I'm stressed. But that's, <laughs> not, that's not the same as subconscious stress. Things you've pushed down here for decades, stress. You know, mine's a situation that's going on now. I'm busy, busy, busy. When I've dealt with it, I move on. Hopefully the damage isn't too too severe. Um, but it tends to be this kind of holding on and suppressed emotional stress. I think that that's the main thing that we need to focus on, I, I think. Obviously, you don't want to be stressed day to day, but life is stressful. You can handle it. You can manage it. There are techniques. There's yoga, breathing, all of these things. But... Yeah. So would you agree that kind of that deep rooted emotional? Oh, thing? sure. First of all, I'm a communication psychologist and a color psychologist. Before I was a doctor, I was much more into psychology. I still do therapy with some of my cancer patients. I've written a book. How many years ago? 27 years ago called Heart Health. I have a few books on the heart, one with magnesium as the ultimate heart medicine. But in this book called Heart Health, it's about the emotional center, the capacity to feel. And in this book, my contribution to psychology or spirituality is I define the heart, give it a, a really solid definition because in the Bible, they don't really define it. They talk about it as the vulnerability of being. The heart feels, and we feel our emotions, emotions and feelings being different. I moved to Brazil 32 years ago, and the, the minute I came, started walking around Brazil from the United States, I left from Florida, I could feel much more heart. Less so 32 years later, because everything's moving in this very civilized direction. People, Western people, and probably the majority of people on the planet, they think 
from the minute they wake up in the morning to the minute they go to sleep and have a difficulty going to sleep because they're still thinking. My biggest conquest in life as a person, when I was a young man, I had a, a mind, a head the size of a barn. So complex, it was, I couldn't even understand myself. And through, well, it took me about 15 years of constant meditation. I was able to get out of my head for 20 minutes at a time. And in the process of doing that, I th my, threw down my mind and my heart, my life. I, I, my, my only thing I do in life is heart driven, not mind driven. My mind is a servant or a slave to my heart. Yeah. You know, Einstein said, I think with intuition. And he defined intuition as a feeling, not as an emotion, but as a feeling. It's a very subtle signal that you feel. But because of people are in their heads, too much in their heads, they're not in their heart. It's their, and that's part of the breathing problem because there's a separation between the mind and the heart. I'm the only, I, I believe I'm the only doctor in the world who lists the tears of the melting heart as medicine. Some people, when you, you know, have in, the, in this heart health work, you know, a very direct way of getting into the heart. You lay down, you breathe, after doing yoga, whatever, you just take your head and you just go straight down and put your concentration at the heart. And the only way you know you're getting, in, you're touching the heart is when that tear comes down. When you open yourself to be vulnerable to yourself and your own feelings, of course, which would include these unconscious things. Yeah. And, um, and when you leave the heart, there's also a tear, either going in or out. Yeah. Part of the problem with this whole emotional thing in the world and how it's affecting people, there are many people who just can't get out of their head and touch their heart and the tears don't come. And yet cancer patients are very vulnerable because they're faced with death. And you ask a cancer patient, I ask every one of them, do you cry? Can you cry? Do you cry? So for me, this whole issue is simplified just between the fact, between the, the separation between the heart and the head. Yeah. And I list it as a medicine because it's that strong. The difference between somebody who's able to be vulnerable and somebody who's not makes a world of difference in their treatment, yeah. in their health and their I happiness. I, I've said this a couple of times on on this show. Um, I was seeing a lady, she's a um, psychologist and coach and business coach and all of this. And she was say, she said to me, she's like, I've noticed with you, you always say, I think. I've never heard you say, I feel. And she's given me some techniques. I've gone away and I've really thought about it. <laughs> and I noticed, I, I said it to my missus, I said it to a couple of my friends about it. and. That, you know, down the line, they've noticed I've started saying I feel and I've noticed I've started saying I feel and I noticed that I just become so much more open. Uh, as you said, I could listen to a song and it brings on a little tear. I can be walking and just thinking about the future. I don't know. It could be anything. Um, obviously, I'm planning my wedding. I'm, I'm thinking about her walking down the aisle. I'm thinking about the first dance and I get this feeling. I, I've I never really had that before. So I think just even just a small amount of work I did and, you know, touch wood, I'm, I'm in good health. Um, so for me, it, you know, maybe there wasn't such profound um, acknowledgements, but just to notice that and uh, yeah, that feeling I get, it's there. It's been there ever since. It's been a couple of years now. 
And when I do meditate, I just, I just, I can get this flood of positive energy. And I was very much like you, as you said, uh, in there, in my brain, thinking all the time, never felt. I didn't have time for feelings. You know, now I watch a movie and there's a bit of a sad thing. I'm, you know, I'm sort of hiding away. Don't let, don't let them see that I'm crying. <laughs> my kids, I have six kids here in Brazil. When we used to all live together, which we don't anymore, but um, they were all growing up. <clears throat> when we watch a movie together and I'd be crying, <laughs> they, they would be amazed. But like, as you say, I mean, they say it's, you know, it's, it's masculine to cry. I mean, I don't really look at it that way. I, I look at it as it feels damn good and I want to let it happen. I'm not going to block it and I'm not worried about it. I just let I let my energy flow and, and my emotions go when when the time's right and it feels good. You know, you know about Christopher Hills? No, I don't think so. He's an, he's, he's not alive now. He's an Englishman. He started the University of the Tree. He had a he had a community in London and then moved to California and had a community called the University of the Trees. And my meditation came from him, my <clears throat> my disciplines. I'll talk talk in a minute about his process. The most unpopular process in the world is called creative conflict. My study of the heart was from him, and he said, the strongest person in the world is the one who's the most vulnerable. A person who is totally vulnerable, they're not afraid of anything. They're not afraid to show themselves exactly as they are. And that's vulnerability, because people don't do that because people judge, you share something vulnerable and the person's not listening or they're talking on top of you. There's a lot of reasons why people keep stay closed. His, his process, creative conflict, which I've developed into a therapeutic process and I use with my patients, not pop is a group process. So you really need three people to do it or more. He had a group of 40 people doing it. Unpopular because the first step was to prove in front of a group that you're listening. So if you take a situation, you, you come home, your wife comes home from work and you never do the dishes and it's a mess and she gets angry and says, I'm so pissed off at you because you didn't do the dishes, you never do them. People, you know, can't, don't don't listen to it. They can't listen to it. And yet, real communication, creation of peace and harmony and love depend on listening. If you don't listen to somebody, you don't listen to your husband or your wife, what kind of relationship do you have? I'm going to have to share this with the missus because that's one of my biggest bugbearers is I talk and she's head in the cloud I'm like did you hear me she's like, yeah it's almost like our roles are reversed in the sense of the listening she's like the man in the relationship yeah. on the other way, I, this is maybe why I'm you know I enjoy doing the podcast because I actually can sit and listen I, I I think it's very um respectful to to hear people out and it's a sure way to piss someone off by not listening so I have high expectations and yeah she's like but you're always talking I can't listen to everything <laughs> and look, look at our politicians. They don't listen. No. So these things all come back to medicine because when you're dealing with somebody and you're trying to resolve their problems, I mean, my most of my work is with ca cancer patients. So their life is on the line. So all of these things matter. I have a patient, a brilliant woman, very intense therapist, end stage cancer. She's doing a lot of good therapies. Now she's going to get radiation treatments because it's eating her bones. But she's not willing to change her life. 
And where is that going to end her up? In a, in a, in a casket. Yeah. You find that the environment that made you sick is not going to be the environment that heals you, right? I'm thinking it's easy for me to say this because, you know, count my lucky stars, like I said, I'm in good health. But I do think that, and I, I have had my fair share of, you know, issues across the years, but you find, or I find anyway, that there's there's sort of lessons here. And almost life is a reflection back at yourself. And I think unless you're willing to listen and to make the changes that are required, then, you know, it's the same environment. It's just, you know, you're going to get the same outcome, right? So, yeah, I think you have to go on the journey. It's, it's almost like a journey. It's been a long journey for me. Now I'm 71. I'm going to be 72 this year. <laughs> yeah. But most people think I look like around 50. Why? What's been my secret besides magnesium? I'm like you. Magnesium, either a lot of it once a day or twice a day. But what made me, my skin look as good as it does, no wrinkles, is hydrogen medicine. I put all my cancer patients on hydrogen inhalation, breathing hydrogen and oxygen. For about six or six months, I slept with it all night long and transformed my my uh, physiology. How do you say it in English? Physiology. How I look. In China, you find it. In in, in Japan, you find it. In the United States, in terms of talking about in doctor's office or ICU units or emergency units or the sidelines of contact sports. You know, if somebody gets a concussion on the on the football field. They should have a hydrogen machine and flood the person with hydrogen the minute they carry them off the line. Ambulances should have it. They shouldn't give just oxygen. Should be giving a combination of hydrogen and oxygen. But modern medicine has got cement in their in their brains, and they just <laughs> what can I say? Yeah. There are certain things that if you go to the right place, like China, you you know when COVID hit, they were in the ICU. They were using hydrogen. Were the British doctors or American doctors, you know, follow that? No. Is, is this a similar outcome again is in terms of getting the oxygen in the cell? Not so. I mean, if you get a really powerful machine, like three liters a minute, which would be two liters of hydrogen a minute and a one liter of oxygen, yes. Most people have weaker machines. The thing about hydrogen, like a hydrogen car, what comes out of a hydrogen car? The, back, the exhaust, pure water. It does the same thing in the body. You know, life has an exhaust. Using oxygen, forget about using glucose and cancer cells, but it's another story, but <clears throat> we have an exhaust. We can create these free radicals. Some of them are good, some of them are necessary, but the worst ones create oxidative stress. And oxidative stress creates inflammation and creates cancer and almost every disease. Hydrogen combines with only the worst free radicals and turns them to water. Mm. So it's a general treatment, you know, like vitamin C injections. You know, they're expensive, and you can't do them every day. Vitamin C, well, it's, it's wonderful, but hydrogen, you can do, you breathe it all night long. If you're 
in a, in a coma, you just put a person on 24 seven. And it's constantly taking down that oxidative stress and taking down inflammation with it. Basic, hydrogen is the most common element in the universe. We have hydrogen rockets and planes and flying cars and buses, cars. The future of life on this planet is going to depend on hydrogen economy. Medicine also benefits tremendously from hydrogen. Sick people, I did, behind me is a hydrogen machine. Logic, medical logic, but that's not how. Let's switch to something you mentioned earlier, iodine. That's my third after magnesium bicarbonate. What's the next thing people need? Iodine. People are iodine deficient. Governments recognized this 70, 80 years ago when they started putting iodine in the salt. Or maybe 100 years, I don't know how long ago, because when people are iodine deficient, very deficient, they get goiter. They found out that iodine is one of the few th things in modern medicine, which of course they don't use it anymore, that where they, they have iodized so salt, that if you have a little bit of iodine, you don't get goiter. I, I'm friends with Dr. David Brownstein in Detroit. He tested 7,000 patients and 96% were iodine deficient. Oof. There's a lot of reasons we're deficient in iodine, like water, like magnesium, like bicarbonate. If you're iodine deficient, how do you recover from disease? When iodine is totally essential for metabolism. Also, iodine kills viruses, bacteria, and fungus. You give enough of it. 120 years ago, you got syphilis. What would they give you? They give you a gram of iodine. Get enough iodine, they'll kill anything. But not us. My cancer pay, all the women, all my cancer patients, the women, I tell them to paint, paint their breasts. If you don't want to get breast cancer, paint the breasts at once a week with iodine. People who get thyroid cancer, breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and prostate cancer, one big cause of these cancers in the glands is iodine deficiency. Why? Because these glands concentrate more iodine than the regular cells. All the cells need iodine. Life depends on it. The metabolism depends on it. Thyroid hormone depends on it. But you're deficient. These glands become vulnerable to becoming cancerous. How, how do you recommend taking it? You just mentioned painting it on the skin so you can do it um what's the term there trend no what's the, what the term there be topical transdermal so in terms of uh do you put it in your water like a lugol's iodine yeah, i use i use uh nascent iodine and lugol's iodine combination oral and uh transdermal painting you know for kids you can just paint it on their skin you don't have to give it to them orally I know some people say about taking higher doses orally in water. Things like if you've got candida or even parasites, as you said, it kills viruses, bacteria. And uh, fungus. And, and fungus. Six drops in, in a cup of water, would you say, is, is, is a Six, good... 10, 15, 20, 30. I never counted a drop of iodine in my life. The, the, the secret to iodine is when you first start, you start at low dosages and you build day by day by day. If you're a cancer patient or even a diabetic, you want to keep getting it up higher and higher. The problem with taking too much too fast is because a person's iodine deficient, 
the thyroids become, um, we have a great word in Portuguese for this, intupido, meaning stuck with fluoride, bromide, which is in white bread, which is in many medications, rocket fuel. When Fukushima blew up, it, blew, it blasted, blasted the Northern Hemisphere with radioactive iodine, one of which has a half-life of eight days, so it disappears very quick. And the other form is 15.2 uh, million years. When you're iodine deficient, which most people are today, because the salt, in the salt they put, you put iodine salt on the table, in one week it's gone. And they don't put much in it anyway. Enough only to stop goiter. The problem is, is you don't have iodine in your thyroid. It, it's like a big radar dish, and it's desperate for anything that even looks like iodine, which fluoride does, bromide. They're the radioactive form. I was going to say things like dental x-rays and things. If you're deficient in iodine, could that be an issue for the thyroid? Yes, you, well, if you're deficient in iodine, you're more vulnerable to everything. Yeah. Because your, your, your metabolism is depressed. So if you take too much iodine right away, it's going to flush the thyroid of all these poisons, and you'll get sick as a dog. And then people will stop. <laughs> and then people will stop. So you start out low, three drops a day, for cancer patient, I'll do three drops twice a day of Lugol's 2% or Nascent. And every day I add a drop and keep adding a drop. And the sky is the limit. If you're dying of something, let's go to the next one, number four on the list. Beside breathing and, and hydrogen and CO2, like, um, selenium. I work with a selenium. It's only available in the United States. It's called lipid selenium, called tongue oil. It was developed by a genius in the last century, a medical genius. At the end of his life, he was a surgeon in New York City. With this form of selenium, he used to inject it as chemotherapy. And there's a book about him called The Doctor Who Cured Cancer. The, the form I, you know, I promote, you know, you just put it under your tongue. For cancer patients, I start them off at either five or 10 drops three times a day. Three, uh, 10 drops three times a day is 15 milligrams of selenium taken safely where every other form of selenium you take, doctors would maybe recommend 200 micrograms, 400, good doctor, 600. Instead of injecting it, you take, put it under your tongue, high dosages. And that's the difference in my medicine, is the dosage. People think of selenium as a supplement, magnesium as a supplement. But if you take enough of it, it makes it into a medicine a potent medicine. And I wrote my book about selenium 11 years ago when I found out there's even a pharmaceutical company making an injectable selenium for the ICU department. Again, these are, we're at the, in the foundation of life. These things are essential like water is to a dehydrated person. What makes selenium so important in your in your protocol? Well, selenium, well, first of all, we live in a mercury polluted world. The air, water and food is saturated with mercury. God forbid you have a amalgam mercury filling in your mouth. Yeah, I wasn't that naive, luckily. In England and Europe, they don't do it very much anymore. Many countries made it illegal. 
except in certain circumstances. In America, the FDA, the wonderful people of the FDA who brought in the COVID shots. Oh, dentists, it's fine to put mercury inches from the brain when it leaks 24-7, fumes. Selenium is the antidote to mercury. The only reason you can eat tuna fish today is this, the, because it, it's the top of the food chain in the sea, loaded with mercury. Yeah. But it's not pure mercury, it's selenomercury. The mercury is bonded to selenium, which is the, the sea is full of it. So when you eat the tuna fish, because it's selenomercury, it, it'll go through the digestive tract and out. If you take mercury fumes, if you breathe it, if you eat it, it's in your water, then no. I had this conversation today about a guy at work who eats, uh, he's been eating a tin of tuna every day for about eight years. And he's got dark bags under his eyes, talking about all different, you know, things, maybe anxiety, issues with sleeping, concentration. He said his uh, attention to, attention um, span has dropped massively, barely focus. I'm like, man, you need to cut that tuna out. God. But as you said, I mean, maybe you're not digesting as much as if it well, if he if it wasn't in the form of selenium mercury, he'd be dead, dead, dead or red. That that much tuna fish. I never could understand how they could make put tuna in a can. And it can be sitting on the shelf for a year and be okay. It's fish. I, I still don't. I still don't understand. But mer, uh, selenium. So in a mercury polluted world, taking selenium makes a lot of sense. In a mercury polluted world, in a um, radioactive world, you know we're full. I'm just. I'm just finishing a book called The Secrets of Light. And the last chapter I'm writing is the downside of, of radiation, whether it be Wi-Fi, cell phones, cell towers, the electricity in the house, Musk bombarding the planet with Wi-Fi signals so you can get an antenna any way you want and, and capture it. I have one here. All this radiation creates oxidative stress. And then, of course, all the chemicals. Mercury, uh, selenium is important for the production of glutathione in the body. Glutathione is the enzyme naturally made by the body, usually not enough in chronically ill pe people, that's responsible for detoxifying the cells. Selenium is an important part of glutathione. I'd have to go back and read my book to give you another 10 minutes on selenium for all the other things. And then he's still discovering things. Yeah. Selenium is just a basic element. You, you're in an area with low selenium in the soil and the plants, higher rates of cancer. They have these statistics. Yeah. Yeah, I think anything that helps support glutathione as well. We're, we're taking glutathione at the moment. Um, but I know you need to be a bit careful because you can essentially um, inhibit the natural production. So I know you need to be a little bit careful, but at the moment we're on a bit of a course um, with some binders as well. Um, I was going to ask you, um, I don't want to take you too far off track. Uh, this is again something I've mentioned a few times. I uh, I had a, a vaccine years ago, stupidly, honestly, I can't, I knew about these things, but I still did it. I went to India. And I had a typhoid vaccine and it had thymosol in it, which is obviously mercury, right? Yeah. And as soon as I took it, I ended up feeling like I had the flu, never had the flu before. And uh, a few days later, or maybe a week later, I was in bed with vertigo. Five days, couldn't lift my head up, had to take their medicine to fix it. The thing they gave me caused it and I had to take their medicine to fix the thing they gave me. Right. And then it went away. Years later, 
during the COVID situation when I was massively stressed because I had a feeling where that was going to take us. Um, and at the same time, actually, we had a bit of mold in our house. We had a, an issue with the gutter and it got clogged up and it got damp and we had some mold and the vertigo kept coming back and it was coming back near enough every time I was stressed and I was in bed for four or five days. And um, I did loads of research and this is kind of what got me into what I'm doing now, actually. So again, negative has been turned into a, a journey. Um, which has led me to this conversation. So it's, it's very positive in a way. Um, so I ended up doing things like uh, did a zeolite, you know, mercury detox and saunas and binders and rebounding and all of this kind of stuff. Anyway, I didn't have vertigo for nearly two years, it just completely disappeared. And then we had a bit of mold in our bathroom, just come out of nowhere. And I thought it's dark and wet and cold in this country is it's horrible. And I was thinking, I, I'm going to clear that up. I know this can be an issue, um, but I'm working all the time. I'm busy and I left it a couple of months and I ended up with vertigo again. And also at the time back then, I was getting tingles all down one side of my leg. That's come back again. <coughs> so I'm, I'm digging in and I'm starting to believe that mercury, when it's in your body, it can end up anywhere. It can end up in the brain, in the fatty tissue, in the cells. But it can also attach itself to the central nervous system. And also so can microtoxins from mold. So where I'm going with this, and this is, I guess, my question here. Could these toxins attach to the central nervous system or to the <coughs> nerve endings and cause all these weird sensations and, um, you know, things like the, the vertigo I got is BPPV. <coughs> but, uh, I forgot the term of it now, um, but yeah, essentially it's like not in my ear. It's it's more through my neck. So I'd imagine it's got something to do with uh, with my vagal nerve, I think. Um, and whenever I'm exposed to a toxic load, so if I'm in a moldy building, I can feel it. I, can, I feel lightheaded. My vision goes weird. I get the tingle in my leg and I'll often ask a question or investigate and it turns out there's mold. So it's almost like it's heightened my sensitivity from a central nervous system what are your thoughts on that well it makes total sense you know mercury is a neurotoxin so its main effect is against the nervous system yeah. of course when you get stressed out or any stress chemical stress or mold or emotional stress. You talk about the vagus nerve. Is that what you mentioned? Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, vagal nerve. Or yeah, the vagal. Nerve. Uh, first thing I would do, you should do when you get off the show, is count how many breaths you take in a minute. Yeah, probably about <laughs> probably about fourteen. <laughs> I've got it down to six before because I do practice breathing at times, but I tend to hyperventilate. You know, I had asthma as a kid and yeah, the breathing's not the best. Yeah, so you should get yourself one of these, which makes breathing easy. 60 bucks on Amazon. Yeah. Thank God for Russia. <laughs> They're medically more advanced, scientifically more advanced than the West. And it's, it all has to do with CO2 physiology. You gain a lot by investing five, ten minutes with one of these machines every day. Do you ever eat clay? No. Like bentonite clay or? Bentonite clay. <coughs> Calcium bentonite clay. Yeah. I drink it first thing every morning. It's like a binder, right? <clears throat> it's a binder. It's a healer. It makes sure when you eat clay, a good clay, that it, like a sponge, it absorbs water. The clay absorbs poisons. So it's like a drainage system, gets things out of the body. Yeah. Better than zeolite. Better than like activated charcoal or? 
Well, charcoal is something else. Charcoal you use more for uh, so acute stomach problem, intestinal problem. But for long-term use, clay constantly, you know, I, I've been living, splitting my life between my sanctuary, where I'm at right now, which is at the end of the world. At night, I can shut my Wi-Fi off and I have zero Wi-Fi signal. And uh, a year ago, we moved to Brasilia so our youngest kids could go to school. We're a beautiful city, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful city. The trees are actually bigger there than they are here, and I'm in the forest. I noticed, because I stopped using clay for a couple of years, and I went back maybe six months ago, that when I'm here in the pure environment, even after taking a shower, I use, need to use deodorant. But when I was in the city, I didn't need to use it because it was more of a polluted environment. So the, the, the diffusion is different. After a few months of using clay, all the smell went away. I didn't need to use the odorant anymore because my, it's purifying my body, mm. which is super important. There are many ways to detoxify, but something like clay in a toxic world is like water for a dehydrated person. You need something to help. So <clears throat> going back to the original, my system in medicine, if we look at the 10 most important needs of the body, detoxification is one of them. Hydrogen is one of them because it's bringing down oxidative stress. God forbid you go for a CAT scan, a PET scan, and they just bombard you with tremendous amount of radiation. We get enough of it just from living just on the surface of the planet. Of course, because we're going into a solar minimum, we also get, have less protection from the sun, so more cosmic rays are hitting the planet and going right through the planet, of course, creating more stress inside the Earth and more earthquakes and more volcanoes because these are high energy things. You know, so high, you know, if you the only thing, the only thing about hydrogen is it's expensive. You to buy a good machine costs you 2,500 bucks. To buy a great machine, 3,500. Not everybody in the world can afford a hydrogen machine. But everybody, almost every, not everybody, but probably seven out of the eight billion people can afford bicarbonate. You don't even need to spend 60 bucks. You can breathe consciously slower and train yourself every day. It doesn't cost anything. So we've been talking about these basic things. They're all basic needs. And water for a dehydrated per person is a, uh, is a good model. I think that's the thing. When, when you, most people don't do any preventative measures. And then when they do end up in the hospital, the first thing they're doing is pumping you full of drugs and they're not asking these basic questions. And you often find it is these simple things, normally from the environment. Do you live in a mouldy house? What's your diet like? Are you drinking enough water? Just see, so I, I don't think it's such a large step to get what you're saying. Um, and especially, like you said, when you do look into things like magnesium and the CO2 levels in the body, it's absolutely key. And your body burns magnesium like it's going out of, you know, out of fashion. I've noticed that when I spray it, I can I can spray twice today and it doesn't sting. It doesn't burn. It just feels fine. And then I can have a stressful evening and I can spray it in the morning and it stings. So it, it, it's almost got a gauge. It almost tells you. You need more. Every time I come out of the sauna, it stings my body every single time, which shows me I'm sweating a lot of it out or burning a lot of it as well. So, um, 
I think these are the things, just daily, daily rituals and little daily steps they accumulate. You know, and the level of medicine that I'm, my, my system, don't even need to ask. With magnesium, you don't have to ask anything. You can assume, right, if you're a doctor and you're not treating a person who's perfectly healthy, who's eating spinach seven or five times a day, just through basic medical intelligence, you can safely assume that the person would benefit tremendously by taking magnesium and taking a lot. I have an essay, one essay, the, um, a gram, I, I suggest as a minimum, a gram a day, which is two to three times what they, the government says you need. They, they talk about you can overdose as well, but it's yeah. water, water soluble, isn't it? So you, you just, you just get rid of it at the back end. Yeah, they're full of, cr they're full of crap. They want you to be afraid of everything good and they want you to take everything bad, which, you know, there's no such thing as a pharmaceutical that's safe. No such thing. Yeah. You find people would sooner rather eat some cine bun or some chocolate bar full of God knows what than spray magnesium on them. And if they have any symptom, they blame the health thing. <laughs> oh, I must are, you take, are you taking it orally too? No, I'm just, I just spray a lot. First thing in the morning, midday after the gym. Oh, will you think to do it orally as well? Yeah. You need to do both. <clears throat> no, tra I'm, I'm famous in the world because I'm the guy who wrote the book, Transdermal Magnesium Therapy. Yeah. That put me on the medical map of the world. So I'm totally into transdermal. I don't, I really very rarely use it transdermally, but I take orally every day. It's the perfect medicine, perfect for constipation. Many people constipated. There was, there was a guy, <clears throat> he was a, a retired pediatrician with diabetes and he had severe neuropathy in his feet. He also had a disease called magnesium wasting disease, which means the kidneys. He would take 20 grams of magnesium orally every day. He said for a person who didn't have magnesium wasting disease, he would suggest two to three grams a day. When you're facing the situation, even like you are with, you know, the vertigo sometimes or pain down the leg, you want to really, because I tell all my patients I'm alive today because I've had more magnesium massages than anybody alive. I can guarantee you that. And when I used to have a magnesium massage, which I don't get anymore, but I would cover my whole body. I had something, I'd be on a massage table. They would just make a mess, cover my body with total magnesium and then give me a massage, which is a beautiful treatment, great for cancer patients. But I'm sure you're not doing that. I'm sure your wife is not going to give you a massage every day. <laughs> So there's only so much, unless you really use it heavily on the on the skin, you want to take it orally or take it in baths. Yeah. But a lot. Take your dose up to bowel tolerance. I tell people, if you don't give yourself diarrhea with an oral magnesium, you're not taking enough. You take enough orally to get diarrhea, then you lower the your body gets used to it, and then you go back towards bowel tolerance, and usually your body can t accept it without getting diarrhea. Number one, one medicine. If you're if you're acidic, you need to take bicarbonate. Magnesium bicarbonate, potassium bicarbonate, magnesium bicarbonate water, many different forms. If you're very sick, CO2 inhalation. The CO2 suit I have, breathing, 
do you um so what whatever i was doing has helped with the vertigo because i went two years at one point it was every three months and that was getting scary because i was bed bound four or five days and you know i was 32 33 at the time and i'm thinking this is this is not right so something i was doing is working and magnesium was one of the key things i think is there, is there anything so else want, well if you want to go for a complete cure take more magnesium use it you're not using it as a medicine you're supplementing with it you're putting a little bit on your body that's not enough if it, one of the most brilliant doctors in the world is in england and she's the one who established that if somebody's in the hospital and they're dying of cardiac arrest and the doctors have exhausted all their pharmaceuticals and you're dying you're dying you, you just you're dying what she would do is inject magnesium showing what it can do when you take really high dosages which of course an injection or an iv use it more as a medicine how old are you 35 you know you have some you know inbuilt you know you're healthy but not perfect if you don't push up towards high, more heightened levels of health. There's no way of escaping the stress of life, whether it be emotional, chemical, radiation, heavy metals. It'll, it could come back more frequent, but you yeah. want it to disappear totally. Yeah, yeah, I thought it was disappeared. I thought it was gone. And I actually interviewed a doctor in she was in Mexico and we were talking about parasites and vaccines and all, all that kind of stuff. And I was talking about my mum, right? So I didn't grow up with my mum. I didn't know her till I was 18. And I was talking about that and how I've, you know, healed from all of the trauma and all of this. That very night is when I got vertigo again. That very night. And this was about four weeks ago. But it was like, like I said, it was nearly two years without it. So I, I'm looking at it from a thousand angles, but emotional. That there, there's something going on there, and this is why I asked you at the beginning about there's a link between toxicity and emotional toxicity. Yeah, yeah. I was listening to a, a doctor, um, Dr. Adams, years ago. She was, she had incredible um, knowledge with mercury, and she was talking about when you detox, a lot of emotion comes out with the buried toxins. So I thought that was incredibly um, interesting as well. And she um, she went really into the whole mercury thing. And that's where I started looking into, you know, that's kind of what really drove me into it. Um, did you mind talking a little bit more about mercury? Because we've uh, we've kind of brushed around it, but. I, I wrote a book, <clears throat> it's not published. Well, <clears throat> it's published and some of it's published called the rising tide of mercury <clears throat> and this goes back how many years oh about 18 years ago <clears throat> and i was working with two people dr rashid Badar, who many people believe was just recently assassinated mm, yeah <clears throat> and dr boyd haley <clears throat> who at the time was the chairman of the chemistry department at Kentucky University. And he was the guy who started doing laboratory experiments on dental amalgam, measuring how much mercury would come out, out of these teeth. So he, I called him my chemical rock. And uh, so I did it, you know, I wrote a book and um, back then, I estimated that there was 20 tons of mercury being put out into the atmosphere every day. You put a mercury on the head of a nail or a needle, and you can pollute a reasonable sized lake with just a little bit. 
mercury, even, I mean, and there's millions of people with dental amalgam. Here in Brazil, they pretty much stopped using it. Americans are, of course, the sickest people on the planet. They consume the most pharmaceuticals than anybody. I'm sure England is close second. Yeah. So mer mercury is a big problem. Drives people crazy, dentists crazy, if they work with it. There's so much research. I mean, nobody, it's so bad, mercury is so bad that they, it's a not, one of the things you will not read anything in the mainstream about mercury. What comes out of the coal fired plants, crematoriums, yeah. industrial municipal incinerators is mercury. The West, Europe, and the United States, they're totally demented, probably because the minds of the people and politicians are mercury polluted. <clears throat> you know, we got want to switch to safe energy and stop using coal and stop using petroleum. Well, in China and in India, they're building coal-fired plants like it's going out of style. I mean, I think in China, a new, new coal-fired plant comes on every week. They built a huge train system just to carry coal to their coal-fired plants. They're polluting the world. You know, we're suffering in Europe and the United States for, for, for energy. Where in China and India, they're just, you know, you need energy for civilization. And they're burning coal like there's no tomorrow. And so I have no idea how much mercury is, but it doesn't go away. We've been doing it for 100 years, progressively worse and worse and worse. It accumulates everywhere in the Arctic, in the Antarctic, everywhere. So it's a real and creates mental, mental problems. Well, we look at all these things with autism and ADHD and uh, even anxiety and stress and like you said, uh, with the central nervous system, if it's sort of sat on the central nervous system, constantly inflaming it or heightening it or triggering, you know, that sort of fight or flight response, because I, I noticed that as well around the time that I had the, the vaccine. And as we went into to COVID, um, the, the, the fight or flight system was just there all the time. I was ready to go. It's only, you know, these two years where I've really been working hard on it, like like all the things we've spoken about, but um, I've actually calmed down. <laughs> so the anxiety was absolutely horrendous at one point. I was going out for about three or four long walks a day. I was just desperately trying to get out of my head. And, you know, you speak to, you can go speak to professionals, but they haven't got a clue that you've got a neurotoxin sat in your central nervous system heightening in your alert system all the time so um yeah like i said it was the, the sauna was like one of the big things binders and sauna that seemed to really get things going um i'm going to look into the clay i've looked i've looked into bentonite clay before but i i opted for the um i used this russian binder which, which was pretty good and uh, activated charcoal as well but i'm looking to the clay you, but, you know these are, anybody who's listening including you on my my site, which is uh, drcircus.com, and circus is S-I-R-C-U-S, not C-I-R-C-U-S, I have a protocol page in the menu item on top, and you see different companies and the products they sell. The one I've been using for, I don't know how many years, is called uh, Living Clay. Incredibly, it's so pure, it tastes clean when you drink it. It's very easy to drink. Um, but all the things I'm talking about, you can see on my protocol page. I just listed a, a second clay, just maybe a month ago. I've never used it, but get the living clay. It's just wonderful. 
Wonderful. Do you have to look into the purity of it as well? As you just said, this is a no. pure one. Well, this, this, yeah. You first of all, it's not legal. Nobody, nobody who sells clay can say it's edible. Yeah. Chlorine dioxide, which we should talk about before we hang up with each other. Another thing, it's illegal. Unless you're a camper, you can use chlorine dioxide to purify your water. If you're a public water professional, you can use, and half the Americans use it, purify water. Why? Because it, like iodine, it kills viruses, bacteria, and fungus, plus gives oxygen. But it's illegal in every country in the world except one to use it to treat disease. But dentists use it, say for bad breath, legally, because bad breath is not a disease. Cancer patients doing chemo radiation get all kinds of problems in their mouth. So doc dentists use it. And they don't recommend swallowing it because if they did, they would be illegal. Same with clay. There's no such thing as edible clay unless you talk to Dr. Circus. <laughs> well, uh, look, it's been great having you on. It's been amazing. Is um, should we leave it there, or did you want to? Was there uh, any protocol we've missed? I know we've been a bit scattered, but uh, I think looking through your work, I think you've covered most of it. Well, no, I covered. I must have thirty items in my protocol, and we've covered ten, twelve, thirteen, maybe. So there's always more. Sulfur, another very basic medicine. MSM. DMSO. No, DM. Well, I used it. I didn't. I don't think I put it on my protocol, but I've used it. Yeah, I have some I, in my bathroom. Yeah. Great to put on top of magnesium. You put mm -hmm. the magnesium on the body, and then the DMSO gets hot. I made a mixture of the two, which I I use it orally as well for the teeth. Really good. Yeah. You know, so one of the problems with, you know, mercury, what is mercury, well, no, how, how does mercury affect the body? Well, it destroys sulfur bonds, disulfur bonds. Some people get a lot of mileage out of sulfur. So, I mean, I can go on glutathione we talked about, it's on my protocol. For people with lung cancer or asthma or any kind of problems in their lungs, I recommend nebulizing bicarbonate and glutathione. So I'd have to even look at my own list to go down through the list. But dealing with the top 15 things, you're, you're way ahead of the crowd. And maybe the last thing I would say is my medicine is a little bit like orthomolecular medicine. The problem with orthomolecular ortho, medicine is you need a doctor. They give you extensive tests. They come out with complex formulas. Where with mine, anybody can just pick it up and go through the first 10 items. And it's like water, meaning fulfilling basic needs. You don't need to be diagnosed. You don't need to be diagnosed to how much mag. No, no doctor would even, except maybe a handful, will recommend it as a medicine. So you have to just make assumptions, and that's what my my process or my system does, based on medical science. Medical science says we're deficient in magnesium. They don't even want to talk about iodine. They don't want to talk about selenium. But the same logic applies. Yeah. Simple, simple. Not very, unless, until you get into the equipment, like, well, this is, as they say, 60 bucks. Hydrogen machine, 2,500, 3,500. Infrared devices, saunas. I'm very much into infrared. We didn't talk about that. I have very, from England, 
I have a there's a the, the, the world's expert, world's number one expert in infrared is in your country. He has marvelous equipment. Um, what's the answer to a person who's cold? Per people fill out my my intake form. What's your body temperature when you wake up in the morning? The do we know science, medical science. For every degree you're below normal, you lose 20% of your immune system. So what's the treatment? You want to warm up the body, sleep on an infrared mat all night, and support your body temperature, your core body temperature. It's too complicated for doctors. Only pharmaceuticals. Poison, poison, a little more poison. Can, can I, you've just mentioned about the infrared. So I use a red light panel. I use it every morning, love it. About 20 minutes every day, drink my coffee and sit in front of that while I'm reading or whatever. Um, what what are the benefits that, that you've noticed? Um, well, you know, for many years I promoted uh, biomats, some that you sleep on. And my focus was on body temperature because mostly my focus was on cancer patients. Also, they're just dream machines, especially if you live in a cold environment or you're getting older and your body gets cold. To sleep in the bed with a biomat radiating infrared into your body all night long is just a dream machine. They're just... But since talking to Mark in his name is Mark in uh, in England near London. I've started paying attention to its effect on the neuro ner uh, nervous system, how it gives power to heal the nervous system. I had a crisis last year, in the beginning of last year of high blood pressure. And I broke down against all my, my will, and I started taking blood pressure medicine. I had just moved to the city. I was playing tennis almost every day. And eventually, I went, I, I, the first medication I, I got from a friend, a doctor friend, ICU doctor. And after two weeks on it, I started getting worse. And then one day I figured out, oh, it's the medication making me worse. Started feeling stuff in my heart. So I broke down and went to a cardiologist. Who, you know, they will never give magnesium. They'll only give statin drugs. And I did a cardiogram. And because I took lots of magnesium, it was good. The next week I did the exercise test. Totally failed. My doctor wanted... The first week she gave me this new medication, very nice. The second day, the second week, she wanted to double the medication. She told me, get off the tennis court. Don't even walk down the block because you're going to have a heart attack. She wanted to schedule me for surgery and put some stents in. I thought about it for five minutes. You know, I have six kids and a wife, beautiful wife. And then I said, no, I'm going to heal this by myself. At that exact moment, I got this cocoon from England, very strong infrared. Between the breathing, the infrared, tons of magnesium, cleaning out my, blood, uh, my vascular system with uh, enzymes, I cut my... Instead of doubling my blood pressure medicine, I cut it in half. Now, basically, I'm cutting it in half again. For, so for me, to answer your question, it helped me, infrared helped me heal my vascular system. It's very, if you use it right, it's very strong. Red light, panels. I, is that an infrared or just red light? Uh, I've got uh, both, two in one. 
Okay, so, you know, it's, you know, um, as I said in the beginning, I'm a color therapy, I'm a color psychologist. And, you know, color is the basis of all, light is, the, and as I said, I'm going to publish a book, The Secrets of Light. Light, we, we are light. We're made of light. We ingest cosmic light. We have a prison system breaking down the light to the seven Roy G. Biv physics, um, violet, indigo, light blue, green, solar plexus yellow, in the belly orange, and the genitals red. We absorb these colors and our personalities are built on it. Physically, Red is a very important color because it's people who have good red energy are very physical and they're stronger, physically stronger. Doctors tell people to stay out of the sun. The sun gives life, gives infrared, gives ultraviolet. We need all these things. You don't go out in the sun, you need to get these things medically. Yeah. That's one of the reasons I bought it because the UK in the winter, I mean, oh my gosh, so bad. It gets light at 8, p- 8 a.m. and it's dark at 4 p.m. <laughs> it's just outrageous. And that's about four months. We're now starting to, it's starting to get dark after work, about 6 p.m. But it's, it's horrendous. I mean, what are you meant to do? And I feel that the red light is amazing. It makes me sleep so well. Um, when I wake up, as I said, it gives me energy um, as well. I don't know how it does both, but it does. Uh, it helps me sleep and it gives me energy. Uh, and in the morning, it's just amazing. Once um, the sun starts coming up a bit earlier, which is only about a month away, really, I normally leave the red light and I'll go out in the morning and watch the sunrise. I, I do that every day. And... Um, yeah, because it's again, it's it's the red light, isn't it? It's the healing red light from the sun. What so. I do when it's not raining is every morning I get on my veranda, and it's right there, and I watch the sun come up, and I do solar gazing. I stare at the light, the sun as it comes up for five to ten minutes. Yeah, absorbing it right through my eyes. So the ancient, my my wife calls me a pharaoh, and uh, that's one of the reasons. That's what the pharaohs used to do. Yeah, I think it's important. You can um, you can reverse bad eyesight with things like cupping and uh, sun gazing. Obviously, not midday sun staring at it, but almost no. sun staring past the sun. No, you have in the first hour of the day and the last. Especially when it's rising, first 10 minutes, totally safe. Not easy in the first few days, but your eyes get stronger and you do first one minute, like iodine, you start slowly and you buy. Yeah. So I love it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I but know. that's the thing as well with the whole anti, it's like anti-life. They're just trying to convince you that everything natural is bad. And they compare the same radiation that comes from 5G towers to the radiation from the sun. And you're just like, how can this? I just can't even bear it, honestly. My, my, I, I mentioned it again in, in another episode. My auntie was just diagnosed with skin cancer, right? She never goes in the sun. I mean, I've never seen her outside ever. She always wears black. She's always covered up. And it's in a place which is covered up as well so it's the fact the thought of the sun causing that on that specific bit of skin is just absolutely zero percent and she she was saying to me because i'm fair head i now have to wear factor 50 even if i go in the sun ever and i said what's your what's your vitamin d status and she said oh it's chronically low but i take vitamin d but vitamin d is a hormone so you're taking synthetic vitamin D without going in the sun ever. I'm just like, it's... and she just couldn't grasp the concept of 
maybe it's lifestyle and maybe you're a bit more in control of this than you think it it's like anything just to blame everything else and to blame you know don't get me wrong i think sitting there bathing all day in the sun's not a great idea no. but to be a <laughs> too, much of, too much of anything is not good yeah but to to, to almost kind of be afraid of this life-giving you know you take the sun out we're dead give it a, a couple of weeks a few months i don't know but it's not going to last very long at all. And to sort of now live the rest of her life totally afraid, because in my opinion, just complete misinformation is, is um, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite sad actually. And she won't look into it. She'll just accept that and, and that's it. No, the, one, the best treatment for skin cancer is iodine. Really? I painting iodine. What I do is I paint with iodine and then um, THC oil. Once the iodine dries, put THC oil, which also has an anti-cancerous effect, you know, medical marijuana concentrated. I had, a, I had a, a mark right here and I started thinking maybe it was turning cancerous. I did the treatment, totally gone. Totally gone. Really? Totally. See, this is a, the other thing as well, and this is what I, I love about your work and people like you. Obviously, if you have a situation, you want to know someone like you, but I think it's good to be doing the research now, to be following people like you as a preventative measure, because if people have done no research and they've not looked into anything and they get some sort of chronic, horrendous, terrifying diagnosis they're not going to have time they're not going to have the mental capacity to do the research they're going to be in panic mode so this is because people always say to me why what are you afraid of why are you always looking into this stuff because i have time to do it now and i want to make sure that i'm living you know my goal is not to live forever it's to live the best i can for as long as i can once i start to decline cognitively especially uh, or you know at least physically if I can't be physically active then you know it's a serious decline from there so for me it's about living that quality of life and living the preventative lifestyle now and it doesn't have to be boring it doesn't have to be you know people would say you know do you not live are you not happy happiness isn't eating the chocolate bar happiness is knowing I'm doing all the right things and feeling good and having you know, my, my mind is so sharp and clear because of the lifestyle that I live at the moment. And I don't want that to end because you soon know when you're feeling the brain fog and uh, tired and fatigued, the quality of life drops off massively. So for me, I think I think this is enjoyable. It doesn't have to be scary. Do me do me a favor. Tell your fiance, your future wife, that she's a very lucky woman. I will do. I'm gonna. Oh, I said so. <laughs> I'm gonna, just I'm gonna snip it this very bit. <laughs> she she lives very much like me as well, which is why we work so well. Uh, we're both on a journey together. If, if she's got something, I'm in it with her. We we actually revert fully reversed her PCOS as well through diet and lifestyle. Um, completely reversed. We actually got a letter through, which was hilarious when we read it. They're all tripping themselves up. Oh, maybe it was a wrong diagnosis. And she's looking at the three prior letters saying, well, it, it seems pretty clear here, but this is what you thought it was. And, and we spoke to doctors since and they're like, you know, it never really goes or, oh, it's impossible. Maybe you got the wrong diagnosis. And, you know, watching them trip themselves up is hilarious. But if me and her have any sort of issue, we're in it together. And I think that's really important as well is two minds are always better than one. I'll, I'll tell you another thing in the same vein. I've never done, I've done quite a bit of video shows like this. I've never had the patience to go in an hour and a half. <laughs> That's why I was saying earlier, should we wrap it up? Because I thought, yeah, you, you've only really ever done an hour. So, um, but maybe that was a bit premature because we've had some, uh, some good content since that. So, but look, on that, honestly, I'm a massive fan 
And this is the thing with this podcast. As a as I'm growing and I'm becoming more confident and getting some more views, um, I'm getting better guests and I'm just loving it because I'm actually reaching out to people that I've listened to and followed or read their books in the past. And it's been an absolute joy so far. It's, honestly, it's a, it's a pleasure to have you on. And yeah, I really appreciate your time. Well, it's been a pleasure too. And thank you very much. I'm going to share your website and any links as well in the show notes. Is there anything you wanted to say before we shut off? Anything that you've mentioned you're, you're writing a new book? Is there anything that you're, you're up to that you wanted to discuss quickly? Well, I would recommend people get my new book on bicarbonate. It's called Medical Miracles with Carbon Dioxide and Bicarbonate. It's the information there. Of course, my books on magnesium, transdermal magnesium therapy, but this new book, I have a book also called uh, my, my second book um, before is called Forbidden Cures, which was mostly focused on integrating chlorine dioxide with the rest of my protocol. And um, it's a little tricky because people into uh, chlorine dioxide are kind of fanatical about it. And they call it a magical mineral, mineral supplement. It is very magical. It is very good. But it's going too far and you get too fanatical about anything. And uh, I guess that's enough for today. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Yes, yes.